everyone, it's Heather from Buffering Saints. And today we are reading in the third section of the book club put together by Laura from What Laura Likes. We are reading Why We're Catholic by Trent Horn. I think there's seven or eight of us doing it. And we're all going to be put into a playlist. I'll have it linked down below so you can go and click on it and watch everyone else's videos. I've been enjoying watching them. I've just been picking like one chapter from the that section for that week but a few of them have been doing like all of the chapters and have still managed to keep them like very short or like within 10 minutes so that's impressive because I can barely do that with one chapter. For this section I picked the chapter about the Pope. It's chapter 12 it's why we have a Pope and basically the short answer of why we have a Pope is because Jesus gave us a Pope. My baby's crying. She just woke up. I mean, my husband is with her, so she's okay, but she just woke up from her nap. So if you hear baby crying in the background, that's why. The Pope is the Bishop of Rome. That's who the Pope is, even so currently. Even back then, the Pope was the Bishop of Rome. But why was Peter the first Pope? So Peter's name originally was Simon. Jesus renamed him Peter, and... In the Bible, when God renames a person, then their whole destiny has changed. So, for example, when God renamed Abraham, originally he was Abram, and God renamed him Abraham, which literally means the father of many nations. That was God's promise to Abraham, is you will become the father of many nations, which he did. So, you gonna help me evangelize? Uh, uh. So, in the same way that God renamed Abram, Abraham, he did the same thing with Peter. He renamed him from Simon to Mommy. Peter. And he did this in Matthew uh. chapter 16, verse uh. 17 through 19. Are you going to read with me? Uh. Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus is making an allusion to the book of Isaiah when Hezekiah, the king of Israel, gave Eliakim the authority to oversee his whole kingdom. Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open and none shall shut. He shall shut and I shall open. I like how G when Jesus is speaking to Peter and the apostles, he says, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and what you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. I think that's cool typology because it says in chapter, in verse 22, it says, the doors are open, they're going to stay open. Whatever doors are shut, they're going to stay shut. So I thought that was cool because I had re never realized that, that parallel between the two verses before. When King Hezekiah gave Eli Eliakim the keys, um, Jesus was doing the same thing and Trent Horn says, so like any responsible Jewish king, Jesus selected a prime minister for his kingdom or the church. So when it comes to the infallibility of the Pope, the doctrine of infallibility really just teaches that the Pope is special grace from God that protects him from leading the, the church into heresy. Even Protestants should believe that St. Peter was infallible because two of his letters are in the Bible, especially Sola Scripturas who believe that, you know, you shouldn't do anything but follow the Bible. Like, no, not shouldn't follow anything else but the Bible. Infallibility doesn't mean sinless. It doesn't even mean that they have to be a good person because as history shows, there's there have been some less than stellar popes. We even see, maybe, we even probably see a, a example of St. Peter where he may have sinned because St. Paul rebukes him in one of his letters when he refused to dine with Gentiles because he didn't want to offend the Jews. St. Paul never denied St. Peter's authority and he still agreed with him theologically. He just was reminding Peter that he needed to basically like practice what you preach. He was just basically telling him, like, you need to live up to what you're teaching others because the whole church is looking to you for direction, basically. And so we see this infallible authority of the Pope, the office, or the seat of Peter throughout the church's history. Uh, first century 
Pope Clement warned the Corinthians to obey him because there was some kind of dispute. So they were telling, he was basically telling them like, you need to obey me in this matter. Pope is the Bishop of Rome. He was talking to the Corinthians who would be like technically outside of his jurisdiction. But in this instance, this is showing his authority over non-Roman Catholics or non-Roman Christians. Another example is the Pope Pope Victor I excommunicated an entire region of churches for not celebrating Easter on the right date. Uh, so some bishops didn't necessarily agree with this decision, but none of them denied his authority to do so. St. Irenaeus even said, it is a matter of necessity that every church should agree with this church, which is the, the church in Rome, on the account of its preeminent authority. I just wanted to end with a quote, even though this is all a summary of this chapter, uh, a direct quote from Trent Horn. Christ will always be the king of, king of his kingdom, but like any good king, he appoints a prime minister to oversee that kingdom. So the Pope has inherited the keys to the kingdom and is faithfully charged with watching over it until the king returns in glory. That's all for this video. That is why we have a Pope. That's why we follow the Pope as the Catholic Church. Sorry if it was a little bit crazy between kids and loud animals. But I hope you have a great day and go watch everyone else's videos. Pray for me. I will pray for you guys. I will see you next time. Bye.